keynote. Uh, he had to deal with not one but two cancelled plane flights on the way here. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him for persevering and making it. Uh, and it, is this working? No. Okay. Um, and uh, he gets to, to conclude the, the technical program at the conference, so we'll, uh, we'll end with a keynote, which is, which is exciting for me. Um, Andre is at the University of California, Irvine. He is professor in the Department of Informatics at the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Sciences, uh, and he's also a faculty member of the Institute for Software Research there. Um, he's got a number of accomplishments in research, community service, and teaching. Um, to name but a few of these, uh, in addition to his impressive list of papers, he's a co-author of the 2005 Configuration Management Impact Report, and also of the 2007 Futures of Software Engineering Report on Software Design and Architecture. Um, he's a regular on PCs in the software engineering field, and he was the uh, program chair of FSE in 2009. Uh, as far as teaching is concerned, in 2005 he was the UCI Professor of the Year for his outstanding innovative educational contributions. And in 2009, he won the Premier Award for Excellence, Excellence in Engineering Education courseware. So I know him, of course, mostly for his, his research work. And in recent years, he's been studying and supporting the design process, uh, including coordination among people doing design and making members of the team, design team aware of what each other are doing, making them aware of the nature of the de design as it evolves. Uh, his work has involved many interesting tools built by him and his, and his students. Uh, one of which is Calico. I think you're going to see a little bit of that. Uh, it's a tool that enables the design at a whiteboard, but it's an electronic whiteboard, so it captures what you're doing and gives a combination of the advantages of a free form, the freeform whiteboard design experience and a tool that uh, actually captures, and, and, uh, captures a model in the computer. Um, I've been following this tool for a number of years, and the more I see it, the more, the more I like it, the more impressed I am. Uh, he also organized in 2010 a very interesting NSF-sponsored workshop called Studying Professional Software Design. Uh, what he did for this workshop is arrange to have three design sessions consisting of, of pairs of designers working at regular whiteboards uh, videotaped. And the videotapes were made available to a number of people from many different disciplines, uh, not just HCI and software engineering, but also cognitive science, design in general, like design in mechanical engineering and architecture and so on, and psychology. Uh, and then all the participants got to write, they got to analyze these videos and come to the workshop and talk about their perspective on, these, uh, on this design process. It was really fascinating to hear all these different perspectives on the same design sessions. Uh, Mary was at the workshop, uh, Michael Jackson and Fred Brooks were there, as well as a number of, uh, of leading people from these, uh, these other fields. So Andre is clearly somebody who understands the design process deeply and he's, he's on a path to understanding it more and more deeply with the research that he's doing. So I'm delighted to welcome him to talk to us about a design perspective on modularity. Thank you, Harold. Um. <laughs> I think that's just for making it here, <laughs> given, my, given my flights. Um, I apologize for not being there yesterday. I literally did have two canceled flights. And as far as I know, my luggage right now is on its way to London. Um, so, <laughs> so something is up. And you notice my laptop didn't work either. So I have Nick's laptop over here. Fortunately, I figured that something was going to go wrong. So I loaded up most of the presentation on there beforehand. So, so we're pretty good. The only thing you're not going to get to see is one of the really big videos. Um, but other than that, I think we have everything. Um, let me start with a brief nod. Um, I wasn't supposed to be the one keynoting. It was this guy over here, David Notkin. Um, he has sent his regards. Um, he is actually doing a lot better um, given the circumstance that he was. He's on the healing path. He's back to teaching. Um, I just wanted to give a nod to him and say, you know, thanks for letting me give an hour-long talk as instead of to a half-hour-long talk. Um, with that, of course, the example that I chose before knowing that my flights were going to get canceled of a modular system was the airlines. Um, so here we are. Um, this was my flight path. I still took this flight path from Santa Ana over to Chicago, Chicago to Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo to here. Um, and this modular system is, as far as I can tell, actually a modular system that works to some degree. Uh, I now will add the caveat to that <laughs> forever. Um, but it's, it's chosen in a certain way. And of course, this was not necessarily how I wanted to fly, and this wasn't the modular system that I wanted. I wanted the modular system that looked like this, right? I really would have preferred a airline that had its base in Orange County and flew everywhere around the world and it gave me direct flight. 
Um, unfortunately, of course, there is no such airline, and that's kind of, kind of understood. Um, also, this is another kind of modular system that could have happened, right? I could have had to take 12 flights. You know, if an airline actually structured all its flights like this, I could have had to take 12 flights to get here. Likelihood of me being here would be very slim at that point. I'm, I, I'm not very fond of changing planes that often. Um, but what, we, of course, we know is that the modular system that the airlines have installed is this one. Um, and it's called the hub and spoke system. Um, it's by and large what they follow. Um, so there's, there's a couple of larger hubs, larger flights in between, and then smaller flights that get you through the hubs and et cetera. It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but there's many reasons why the airlines choose this, um, partly because it's, it's still understandable by the customer, partly because it, it makes them money, as opposed to this one, which might not make them money, um, partly because when things go wrong, they tend to be able to fix them in certain ways, and the system tends to absorb things um, fairly nicely. Of course, in my case, not necessarily, but you know, what can you do? Um, so, but that said, there's a lot more to this modular system than meets the eye, right? When I look at this, when I wanted to book my flight, the first thing I looked at was how do I get there? What, what, are, what are the steps, what are the flights, and what are the connections? Um, but if I want to look at a little bit deeper level, one of the things I can also look at is how long are these connections? So I can actually sort of jump down a level of abstraction and say, you know, I'm supposed to spend two hours in Chicago, about four hours here. That's not that bad. I'll take that. Um, at the same time, the airline might be looking at the same modular system in a very different way. Right? They might be looking at it as what kind of airplane is flying here. Is it a small airplane, is it a large airplane, or oh, it's one of my code share partners in this particular case. So the airline is looking at that same system um, from many different directions than I would look at it as a consumer. Um, and in the same way, you know, they might look at actually the flight path of the actual flight so that they can come back to home base and can do the same thing over and over again. So there's a lot more detail and in some sense different levels of abstraction at which I can actually examine this modular system. Um, now why do I talk about airlines? Because I wanted to introduce modularity and my definition of modularity, because that's what we all are doing at, at partly this conference, is um, to, to the discussion here. And to me, modularity is really a property. Sometimes we tend to talk about it as a concept, modularity of the concept. We want something good. Um, but to me, it really is a property of the system concerning how well its parts and the relationships among the parts, right? The parts are the flights, the relationships are the connections and the hubs, support a certain purpose. And depending on that purpose, the modularity might actually be good, might be bad, might be somewhere in between. Um, so I see modularity then as a direct result of the specific modularization that is chosen, the specific parts that are there and the specific relationships that are chosen. So um, if I go back to this picture, right, if they had chosen this one, that would be a good modularity from my perspective. It would be a bad one from the airlines. This one is probably average on both, and this one might be bad on the airlines and bad on me as well. So what I think about modularity is it's a statement about how well these parts and these relationships support this particular goal. And of course, I can exist and I can examine this at multiple levels of abstraction, um, not just one level of abstraction, and from these multiple different perspectives. So to me, the modularity of a system, the modularization is what I like to call it. The way it was broken down in its parts and its relationships leads to multiple properties if, as, if I examine those from these different directions. So software, that's, that's why we're here. Software has that same kind of effect. I could have one large module, I could have a set of medium modules, I could have lots of small modules, lots of these. Um, and so I also must decide upon modularization. Just like the airlines need to build a schedule, I need to figure out what the modularization of my software is, the, the breaking it down into parts and what the relationships amongst the parts are. Um, this also leads to modularity, of course, we've been talking about that, that can also exist at multiple levels of abstraction. So let me talk about that first, right? I can look at it at an architectural level. I can look at it at the jar file level, as, as our keynote earlier this morning said. I can even look at it at the class level. Depending on who I am and depending what I'm doing, the modularity of that might be good or bad. And that also came out in the talk this morning. You know, the services might be great, but underneath it might be really bad if I'm actually a programmer and need to maintain it. Um, so it really can exist at multiple levels of abstraction for a single system. And it can also be examined from multiple perspectives. 
you know, it's one of the things that I tend to do is I tend to talk to developers and, you know, suppose you're talking to the performance engineer underneath, um, let's say, the Google infrastructure. If they're looking at the modularity of the system and they need to do something from the perspective of performance, um, that might be very different from somebody who's looking at it from a usability perspective or is looking at it from a maintenance perspective who, who just has to fix a, a small task. So the modularity can expose itself in different ways and I can judge that modularity in different ways depending on who I am. And that, that's going to be sort of underneath the talk that, that I'm, that I'm going to be giving. So when we look at the purpose of modularization, right, I said with respect to a specific purpose, there's an interesting hierarchy of sort of going from an individual developer to an organization. And many of these, I think, came out in Mary's talk, despite the fact that I wasn't here. I had spies who told me what everybody talked about. Um, so there's the individual developer who really needs that reduced complexity of understanding and reasoning. So when I'm looking at that system and I have a particular task, I would like the parts and the relationships to be very clear to me with respect to that task. Um, there's the development team where it enables parallel work. If we have all these independent pieces, maybe people can actually work on them independently as long as the relationships are well specified. There's the system's life cycle where we want it to enable evolution, gracefully accept additional behavior, additional um, functionality. There's the multi-project purpose where now we want to reuse, and then finally, of course, at the organizational level, in many ways, we want to actually configure, customize, and create new variants of that system all the time. So there's, there's different purposes for that same concept of modularization and modula modularity that we're trying to achieve. The, these, I would say, are fairly standard at this point in, in the field, and we look at them um, regularly and say, this is what we want. But it's good to spell them all out and, and understand that they actually have competing interests, right? My interest in reducing complexity of understanding and, and reasoning might well clash with this, this organizational interest of, the, of this configuration. And, and how do you resolve that and how do you choose then a modularization that supports that is, is an interesting question. So there's a large body of work. This, this is my, my 150 sites from the paper in one slide, almost. Um, so, and note that I don't include the citations in the actual presentation. They are all in the paper. Um, so that, that just got too unwieldy. Um, there's theory work on modularity, modularization, start, starting with the early work of Dijkstra and, and uh, Parnas, et cetera, setting objectives, guidelines, criteria. And in the modern world, actually, we're looking at comparisons of different kinds of modularizations. Which one is good, which one is bad, we're trying to assess that. There's programming languages and tools, ways to express the modularity in the actual language. Um, so object orientation, interface definition languages, aspect orientation, multidimensional separation of concerns, all try to give us a programming language, a building language, in which the modularity is actually encapsulated inside the actual system. We can go beyond programming languages when we get the software architecture, product line architectures, multiple views, early aspects, traceability. Um, there, we're no longer sort of residing at the code, but we're trying to build these facilities at a higher level of abstraction. And then there's an interesting line of work which says, you know, basically builds on this um, uh, the theory of de dominant decomposition that no matter how well you can sort of partition things here, there's always going to be these cross-cutting concerns. I always need to be able to access them. So what these folks are saying is, well, there's, there's modularity in the language, but what about the things that I want to access that are orthogonal to that? Um, so you have conceptual models, concern-based programming, and other approaches that try to say, you know, we need to do this, and how do we do that? So these fall out in an interesting perspective. So if I put, put this in a, in a little framework, and I, I take the, the, the sense of the concern, in some ways the individual programmer and concern. Um, the modularity or the modularization could either be embedded in the language, as I said, in the programming language, or it could overlay it, right? It could have traceability links on top of the things that I concern myself about. Then what I also could do is I could explicitly specify them, or I could essentially query for them. I could derive them from the actual system. So what that then leads is these four canonical approaches, where I would say most of the work has been over here, which is modularity embedded in the language, it's explicitly specified by the programmer. So the facilities that we need for that is this in-language modularization kind of, a, kind of uh, facilities. And that, as, as I said, we, we talked about a lot. But here's another one where it's overlaid but still specified. So here what you have is extensional concern modeling where somebody says, I have a concern, and here's the exact places in the code where it is. Now, of course, I have to maintain all these links. I have this traceability issue. Um, but there are approaches nowadays that are trying to say, well, if I make this change, the links probably are going to change this way. And if I make that change, they're probably going to change that way. So there's environments that are now trying to start to help you maintain that traceability for concerns that are not expressed necessarily like this. Of course, when we jump to the other side, 
I can maintain these links extensionally and always have them available, but there's also some recent work that says, well, maybe we can just query for a concern. We can type in a query, the feet work, the myelin work, et cetera. What they're saying is, well, we can derive the query, we, we can have a query, derive the concern, and present, um, as in essence, um, the, the concern to you. And then finally, and this one is, has been thought about in some ways the least, but is in, in some ways to me the most interesting is, okay, could I derive an in-language modularization from the entire system? Could it have the entire system run a query and get a subset of my code that looks like a nice set of modules that concern just that concern? And when I make changes there, they're going to be reflected down there in the code. I'm very curious about what would happen there. And what's interesting about this framework is that we've, we've put all this effort here, but there certainly is a balance here, right? We, we've got this concern about over-modularization, modularizing too much at, at too high a cost. Well, if, if, you, if you focus on that, then you have to sort of move out to other approaches if you want to capture the modules and concerns that you're interested in. And so what this framework gives us is some, some canonical limitations and strengths of each of these approaches and, and sort of tells us that all of these maybe have to be used in combination or which ones are better, which ones are not. Um, there's a lot of, lot of questions there. But one thing that's underneath this, if I go back to this notion of modularity, Here's the same set of things that I talked about modularity, but there's an additional bullet here that tools really matter, right? The tools that I put in the hands of the programmer, in the hands of the organization, in, in the hands of the developer, um, they really matter, perhaps especially, but certainly not, ex not exclusively when modularity breaks down, right? There's lots of times when it breaks down, I need to access all, th all sorts of things everywhere. Can tools help me with that? Um, and so this is really my view of modularity there. It's a direct result of modularization, exists at these multiple levels of abstraction, and tools help me manage that, um, as a, in, in addition to, of course, the programming language and other, other facilities. So, but now, now, now getting to the point of the talk. So having sort of laid this groundwork, there, there's this interesting question. It's a very innocent one. It says, how does one actually choose a specific modularization? Right? So I can break down my program and put all these classes together in lots and lots of different ways. Um, how do I do that? Well, there's, there's, there's this term called design, and the process of modularization is one of design. It's a pretty straightforward answer and one that we're kind of used to. We're used to saying designing, you know, that's where you decide on the code structures and, and et cetera. But I want to go one level deeper and ask the question, what is design? Um, and now things are getting interesting. Um, so I had a grad student who, who was willing to address that question, um, especially in the context of software, by approaching it from an interdisciplinary perspective. So as opposed to reading books on software design and everything else, he started reading software design books. Uh, or he started reading non-software design books. Um, so there's a whole series of books highlighted here from Christopher Alexander to The Art of Innovation to Design Methods, The Reflective Practitioner, that many of us actually know. Um, and he started reading that. And then we also got to some more recent literature. Um, the, this design field that we've known as Simon and Schoen and others um, has really evolved to actual studies of how designers work in these other disciplines. Um, so this is a wonderful book by Nigel Cross. Um, it's called Designerly Ways of, of Thinking. Um, there's this semantic turn over here, what designers know, how designers think, uh, cognitive artifacts of designing. So these are people that are very curious about how design happens, not at the overarching process level, but in the minds of individuals. How do I approach a design problem, and how do I work and grapple with the problem that I'm, that I'm tackling? And so after reading a subset of these books, the grad student got kind of mad at me um, because he said, hey, you forever tainted my way of thinking about software design, and we're going about it very backwards. And I said, good, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. Now let's see if we can still get a software PhD out of that. And eventually he did. Um, so um, trust your advisor. That's the motto right there. Um, so, <laughs> so he read all this. And out of this comes, comes an interesting perspective on design. And, and I'll try to do that by contrasting some of the definitions of software design. Right? So when I went a couple days ago, I said, let's look on the internet and look for some definitions of software design. Well, here's one. The organization of a software system into modules, components, classes, or other units. We've sort of seen some of that today. Um, after the purpose and specifications of software is determined, very important, after the requirements are done, um, software developers will design or employ designers to develop a plan to a solution. So th this, is, this is a pretty commonly held view, although we're sort of starting to move away from it, right? The agile community, um, the iterative model, we're not necessarily seeing the big phase of design, but there is sort of this notion, we know what we got to design towards. Now let's contrast that with some other definitions of just design, design in general, okay? And here's a whole, whole subset of them. Design making in the face of uncertainty with high penalties for error. 
Um, to choose the things we use shall look as they do. Or relating product with situation to give satisfaction. The imaginative jump from present facts to future possibilities. Um, and here's a few more. To plan and intend for a purpose, to initiate change in man-made things. Now, if you look at these, um, these are pretty fluffy in some ways. right? They're, they're not necessarily very precise about what they're trying to capture. Um, but they're not necessarily all stated, and I'm going to make a little leap here, by artists who are talking about design or by graphical artists or, or other folks. Some of these definitions are coming from engineering designers. So what one would call hard disciplines of design where we live with constraints and have to, have to achieve a certain purpose. Um, so rather than adopting one of these definitions, actually what we did is we sort of tried to abstract away some of the lessons that exist in them. And there's really three themes to all of these definitions that get to the heart of what we think design is. Um, so the first, whoops, the first one is design involves decision making. Right? As a designer, you have to make decisions, and those decisions shape an envisioned future. So design is not about something that we have now, but something that we're going to make in the future. And as a designer, I get to decide what that's looking like. These decisions together form a plan for actually enacting this change. Right? Part of designing is making sure that we eventually get there. Part of an architect is laying out the blueprints for how to build it. Um, part of a graphic designer is laying out um, the, the graphics that eventually get, get the advertising campaign going, et cetera, and et cetera. So for actually enacting change in the world, and by that I mean physical change. So there's actually something that changes in our world. There's a building that gets built. Um, there's a railroad that gets laid. There's a bridge that gets constructed. Um, so these decisions form a plan for actually making that happen. And then the change is consequential. And this is very important. It's underneath almost all of these definitions. The stakeholders must be satisfied with the result. Right? If I design a library and no one recognizes that it's a library when they're walking by, we have a problem because people won't go in knowing that it's a library. Um, if I design a teapot and no one buys it because the handle gets hot, you know, I've maybe designed a beautiful teapot, but there's the consequential change of the stakeholders who are not necessarily very happy. So these three themes together then lead to our definition of design. So our definition of design is to decide upon a plan for change in the world that when realized satisfies stakeholders. So this puts these, these three parts together um, and basically says, as a designer, you have to come up with a plan that eventually leads to this physical change in the world, so the software or the bridge, where people are going to have experiences, and these people are already audience, and there's some other stakeholders, of course, reflecting on that, on, that, on that process. It's very much predictive, because I don't know what the change in the world will actually look like. I can often not predict the experience of people. Um, but this is an interesting... Uh, picture that now if I pull out that change in the world and I say, okay, what is it about that change in the world that a designer really needs to worry about? It is one, satisfactory experiences, and two, this plan for realization. And if I actually factor these out into a couple of key questions that you have to answer is the first one about satisfactory experiences, what is it to accomplish? Right? If I got to make a teapot, it's got to boil water. Um, so what is it to accomplish is probably the first question we always have to ask. How does one interact with it? Right? If I have a change and I have to actually work with it, how am I going to interact with it? With the library, with the bridge, with the building? Um, and just in case anybody thought that buildings were always designed right, um, come visit our UCI computer science building one day. Um, there's some interesting features I can explain to you how they were designed and you know, how architects don't always get it right. Um, so we're not necessarily doing that bad as a discipline here. Um, but what is it to accomplish? How does one interact with it? And then on the plan for realization, often what you find in design is what's the conceptual core? There's a word in architecture called parti, where they're looking for the actual fundamental concept in which the architecture of the building is going to work. And once they have that, everything else falls out. Um, and th that happens in many, many other disciplines. The designer of a product often looks for the theme, looks for the way it actually is distinguished, is different. Um, and that I would call the conceptual core. And then what are its implementation details where we round out everything that's there. Now, if you're still with me on this, then if I relate this to software terms, it's actually not that all that different than what we have before, of course. Application design, interaction design, architecture design, and implementation design. Now, if I were to call these requirements user interface design, architecture design, or high-level design, and low-level design, you would all say, yeah, those are familiar terms. And that is actually very important to me because these are familiar terms. But by having derived it in this way, I've said something very important about those terms. I have said that each one of those is actually designed. Right? The requirements to me are designed. The requirements to me are not interviews with the customer that I just specify and then I get to design. When I talk to a customer, 
we're actually designing the requirements. We're going back and forth. We're making important decisions about what this thing is going to look like. That is a design process, whether you like it or not. We might make storyboards. We might make presentations. They give us feedback. We change what it looks like. We change what it does. Those are all design decisions that we're making. The same for the programmer, right? It is very well possible that a programmer in the last week before the release might implement an algorithm that doesn't, that doesn't do the things it needs to do and as a result slows down the system as a, as a result of which the experience is horrendous. Or the programmer is laying out a user interface and it's not doing what it's doing. So my contention is that each one of these is designed in one way, shape, or form. And that design of all these actually relates to each other. So you're constantly doing almost all of them at the same time. Um, so if you do this, of course, if you put it in this perspective, and if you buy into that, that says that seen through this lens of general design, software design takes place across the life cycle. This is what I was just talking. We're designing um, across the life cycle. But that also means that the final design really is the code that gets shipped. Right? That's where we now have made all of the final decisions, and in some ways not yet, because we might configure the system still at the customer, and depending on how we configure it, the experiences might be different. But that final software is really the final design that rep represents where we've made all of the decisions. And then finally, those, those life cycle approaches, the waterfall and you know, the, the agile approaches and, and the iterative approaches, are merely high-level design processes, and that's really the way we should think about them. Um, so structured ways of trying to say this is an approach. Um, and you know, this then says to me that the waterfall model actually in some cases is fine, right? A design problem that we've done many times before that is very familiar, we just need to get what we need to get, design it and hand it to the customer. And that is a very viable model in many, many kind of design disciplines. Um, things that are more complicated, we might need more complicated design approaches, design level, um, high level design approaches. And so we might go to the iterative model and et cetera. So, these are high-level design processes from which we can choose. There's not one that's necessarily better than the other one in all situations. We just got to figure out what kind of design problem we have on hand and then apply the right design level process that we have. So given this, then of course the questions fall out. Who are the designers? Well, they're the architects, the user interface interaction designers, database designers, but also the business architects, the requirements engineers, the programmers, sometimes the testers, right? Test-based programming. When I'm actually designing what my software is going to do by specifying the test cases, I'm certainly making choices there. Sometimes the clients. And so any study of modularity and its role in design really should look at that full range of people, not just the programmers who are interacting with the software. Um, the same with what do they produce. Here's a couple of things that I've seen designers produce. Well, they produce lots of diagrams, sure. Um, designers also produce lots of sketches, lots of paper sketches, whiteboard sketches, and et cetera, um, that get made all the time. I've seen designers who say, the first thing I do when I have a problem is I make a mind map. And when, that wasn't in your software engineering book. He said, but yeah, that's really helpful because um, mind maps I really like, and I actually get to think about it. They produce documents, presentations. Um, some of you will know Crystal Lopes. She likes to make Second Life prototypes. That's the first thing she does, building something in Second Life and then actually producing it for real. Um, code, in some ways, is also an artifact of design. So if you're going to look at modularity in design, you need to actually look at all of these kinds of artifacts. And then finally, how do they produce it? Well, we might apply knowledge like patterns or styles, reusing past solutions. We might have pure idea generation, which typically is equated to design, but it's not the only way we design. Um, brainstorming, doodling, talking, mind mapping. Um, researching via approximations, prototyping, storyboarding, um, actually building scenarios that the customer looks at. Those are ways of actually investigating, is this a good approach, yes or no, and getting feedback. Um, and then communicating, so in interviewing the stakeholders, calling experts, right? There's lots of design where we call an expert who says, hey, how does this work? Um, so the study of modularity and its role in design should take all of these activities into account. And so when I come through the research agenda, and then we get to the fun part of the talk, I promise. Um, so there, there's the research agenda for me is then where lie the benefits of modularity in each of these design activities, not just in the system, but in the activities that we engage. How does modularity help me and how does it not? What forms of modularity enable these benefits? So how do these benefits actually arise? And what is the cost of achieving this kind of modularization that leads to that? Um, where do the current modularization techniques fall short in supporting <coughs> software designers? So it's basically saying, where, where are we good for now and where are we not good? Um, and in what ways can we actually approach this, um, this problem, the, the things that we recognize that don't work? Um, so what I did in the paper, and actually a lot with the help of Nick Lopez here, who was a, a co-author on the paper, um, was build essentially seven vignettes, small little stories, 
of des a design activity and then examining that design activity from the perspective of modularity. And so in this talk, I'll highlight four of them, sketching, refinement, design progression, and distributed development. Um, and then also with some luck, the demo works, um, and we'll show you a little demo of a tool that we're doing um, that, that is sort of a very different approach to, to software design. And note that Harold mentioned the Studying Professional Software Design Workshop. A lot of what I will be talking about, the first three in fact, were drawn from that workshop where we handed a, a, a design task to designers. Um, they were the principal architects of Adobe Illustrator. Um, they were key architects at um, Intuit. They were other people, all highly qualified designers. They're, they're in important positions. They've done this a long time. Um, and we gave them a design task, and we, and we really sought for, in some ways, experts, right? Professionals who've done this for a long time. They weren't necessarily experts on the task we gave them, um, and that's an important, important di distinction to make. Um, but their behaviors, hopefully, and how they approach the design problem were representative of how they work in, in, in real life. Um, and so these videos, we studied them, and other people studied them, and, and these, these are some of the results that we have there. So the first one is sketching. So let, let's look at this. This is an actual sketch taken from, actually not even, the, not even this, this workshop, from a company that's local um, that has built a healthcare integration engine. It's an open source piece of software. Um, it's in many, many hospitals around the US and slowly in, invading the world as well. Um, and it started as a very small system and has grown into 800,000 lines of code, something like that, very large. And they designed this system. And how do they design the system? Well, like this. They always tend to produce pictures like this. When they have a design problem, they don't go to the UML tool, they don't go to Rational Architect, they don't go to any of the other ones, they run to the whiteboard. That's where they design. Um, and so what I've collected is a few pictures that are representative of what I've seen on these kinds of whiteboards. Um, this is actually the architecture of that system. It doesn't really look like the architectures that we see in the books. Um, but there's some resemblance, right? There, there's an in integrated healthcare engine. Here's things that touch that. Um, there's some protocols like SOAP and, and other ones that, that address that. And what they did was essentially talk through this design problem while drawing on the board, while arguing, and, and while, while drawing, essentially. Erasing things, adding things, and et cetera. Now, one thing that you notice is this is not really an architecture notation. It's not a formal notation that they use. It's highly informal. And this shows that a little bit more. This is from the same company. This was a very important diagram to them. You wouldn't know but from the way that it's actually drawn. Um, but this was a very important diagram to them. Because again, this is the hub. Um, there's the lab. And here's some other sites. And there's clearly an architecture happening here that's distributed, where, people, where, where different components talk to each other. Notice the erased arrow over here. That's no longer important. Notice stuff erased over here. But this was a crucial design document, design diagram, that served a very important purpose to them. It had a big not erase next to it for a really long time. Um, and notice the absence of detail, right? And part of that is they all know what the system is looking like. They all have a shared model of that architecture, so they don't need to draw out the entire architecture. They only need to draw out the parts that they are discussing. They don't need to provide the rest of the detail. Um, here's another picture from that, that same company. Um, now what they drew over here was actually not the software, but was the problem. What problem were they trying to solve? This is another key thing that you see on many whiteboards when designers are working. They're not just drawing this, the structure of the solution, the architecture or the requirements. They're trying to understand what the problem is like. Um, and they're talking through that problem and then moving to the solution and moving back to the problem and moving to the solution and moving back to the problem. So they're actually drawing here, in this particular case, patients and particular diseases, and they're sort of in different buckets, and different patients with a different disease aren't sort of allowed to cross, cross paths in hospitals. Right? If you have an open wound and somebody is highly infectious, infectious, you probably don't want the two folks in the same room. Um, so the software that they're building is sort of this population management software. Who's where and what are they doing? And these represent different kinds of populations. Um, and then finally, here's, here's another one. Um, where one of the things you see is sort of this mix of notations. That's also what happens. All these diagrams, you know, this is requirements over here. Here's a little client plugin, mini architecture. Here's an architecture that they drew. Um, here's a little code that, no, this, is, this was a note. Um, and sometimes you see them drawing pseudocode, sometimes a little user interface, and all that on the same board, right? We're not in user interface design mode, or we're not in code structure mode. We're constantly going back and forth between the different kinds of design um, that we're engaged in. And one of the things that's interesting is these circles with these little L's 
actually are very important with respect to the piece over here. They're a homegrown notation for just that design session where the circles with the L represented things they could plug in into something else. They didn't have anything that said plug in. They just drew a circle with an L and somebody said, ah, so we could plug that in. And then somebody else started adopting that notation. This is something you see very often um, in sketching. So when now we go to back to modularity, um, you know, one of the questions to ask is, designers sketch a lot. And there's actually lots and lots of this kind of whiteboard content that you can obtain. So what are the parts and relationships, right? If we go back to the definition of modularity, what are the parts and what are the relationships that they are drawing here? Um, and from a modularity point of view, what do these parts and relationships support? Well, remember those purposes that I talked about earlier. Well, clearly they're trying to understand and reason about the system. So something is happening here that they're trying to do that's familiar. They're also sometimes doing parallel work. The video that I can show you shows the two designers arguing, and then all of a sudden, both of them are drawing on the whiteboard separately. One is working out one part, one is working out another part, and then they come back together. Um, so they're doing some parallel work. There's some reuse happening, and there's some evolution happening. Often it's the system that they're trying to evolve. So these are very familiar reasons from a modularity perspective um, that are exhibiting themselves in the work of these designers at the whiteboard. Um, and what can we do then in some sense? Can we learn from what these designers do? And can we build tools that actively support them in this kind of sketching work? And can these tools have modularity embedded in them in some way, shape, or form that matches the way they work? And hopefully, you know, when the deck cross the fingers on the demo, I'll show you a little bit one of the directions that we're taking. So the second vignette is refinement. So here's a picture of a whiteboard. Um, this is uh, from the workshop. It's a video that we didn't share with the workshop. Um, but where people were working on this simulator, so what they were asked for was a traffic light simulator for students in an engineering class. And so they have some classes listed over here, but that's not how they started, right? Those classes were not the first thing that they were designing. They started with something different. And here's an interesting picture of how that something different sometimes evolved. What a number of the groups did was they wrote down just things that potentially were important. And that list got modified and that list got changed. And then at some point, some hour into the session, all of a sudden, one of them took that and started drawing these arrows and say, hey, there's relationships amongst these things. We should think about that. And then some half hour later, they actually redrew this into this, where now they start to actually draw more of what looks like a UML-ish kind of diagram, though there's no methods, et cetera, um, specified yet. So there's a refinement process that happens. There's this evolution happens. There's this incremental level of detail that they're, being provi that they're providing while they're working through the design problem. Now here's another one that shows that a little bit more explicitly. They set objects, here they are. Then they put boxes around them. This was a big achievement because now these things became more important. They become more important in the design session. Um, and then they organize them. And one of the things we notice is that intersection here was separate, but now all of a sudden has traffic lights and sensors as a hierarchical containment. So they're saying those are part of the intersection and the intersection is going to govern how this is going to work. Um, and I think one of these, this, that, sliders, visual map, I think the visual map has completely disappeared. So one of the objects that they were considering has just disappeared as a result of, of design. But now here's another one of refinement. And this one I find particularly interesting. They were working through how are these traffic lights going to work. So the first thing they wanted to do is they were thinking about traffic lights and you know if green goes this way, then green can also go that way. And then after that, you have green crossing. And after that, you have each going you know, the, the, the parallel ways. And so they were trying to draw essentially a state diagram, because they were computer scientists drawing this, so they were trying to draw a state diagram of how the, how the traffic light worked. Um, did that initially here, then build a more detailed one that they said, these are really the states that we're going to choose. And then they did a, a very interesting leap. You see here one little tab over here. And that little tab, all of a sudden, made this interface part of the user interface of their system. So what started as problem understanding, as a definition of how their system was going to work, all of a sudden got reappropriated, completely reappropriated for being part of the user interface of this system. So that's a very big leap that they're making there, and a very, very, you know, very big leap of refinement where they just took something and said, oh, that fits over here. When they were working over here, they had no idea that this was going to be user interface stuff, but it did become as part of the design, design work. So research questions here, of course, are again, how do the parts and relationship evolve in sketching? So are there other ways that these designers actually reappropriate and, and build these refinement patterns? Um, from a modularity point of view, does the purpose switch? Right? Does the purpose from understanding to actually building a solution switch? 
Um, to what degree may typing play a role? Right? These kinds of diagrams, they do get reused along the way. So they draw lots of these kinds of intersection diagrams. Now suppose that they want to draw, change one of these. Um, maybe they want to change all of the other ones. So can we maybe add typing at a certain point on the sketching on the whiteboard? Um, do designers ever unrefine? Does it happen that to say, this is too refined, I'm going to go back? Um, and from code to sketch, right? A lot of work that they sketch on the whiteboard is with reference to an existing piece of code. Um, can you actually bring that piece of code up in sketchy form as opposed to in detailed form and then work with it and see what that means? Um, now, here's the video clip I cannot show you, unfortunately, because um, that was a two gigabyte video clip that didn't fit on the little USB key that I was trying to give to Nick. Um, but in the video clip, you see some of the designers at the workshop actually working through the design problem. And they first make a list of things that might be important. Then one of them already has a user interface up. And then the next one is working out the list of requirements. Then they change the things that are important into requirements. Then they wipe out the user interface, do it again. Then they wipe out the requirements, write on a class diagram. And all the time, they're talking, right? So the things that they're drawing and the things that they're, that they're doing are supporting the conversation, right? The conversation is where much of the actual design happens. So what we did <coughs> was we did an analysis of the kinds of things these people talked about. Um, and so here you see six design sessions, and you should know that the top three are the professionals, and the bottom three are the non-professionals. They're the graduate students. So we actually took graduate students of our program and said, why don't you design the same thing too, and we'll go analyze you as well. And they happily did so because we paid them some money and et cetera. Um, so these are the professionals. These are, these are the, the, the grad students. And these are the ideas and by whom and when they're raised. And so what we did was we did a lot of tracing. What, what's a contribution to the actual final design? What's not? What idea builds upon a previous idea and all those kinds of things? So we build a lot of these kinds of diagrams and try to study this problem from a variety of different ways. Now, the one that is most interesting to me um, is actually this one. And what we did in that one is we identified the key topics that emerged for each of the design teams as the things that they, that they tended to focus on when they talked. And so one of the things you see, you know, this team focused on three things, four things, six things, five things, five, and five. So the grad students are remarkably uniform. These were, these were less uniform. But there's a fabulous phenomenon here, which is that these professionals tended to talk about two subjects at the same time. And you see there's always two bars there next to each other. And these bars are not always the same bars. In fact, these bars tend to rotate. So what these folks tended to do was have a subject and juxtapose it with another one, make some design progress, pick another one, juxtapose it with another one, make some design progress, and kept rotating through that. They didn't do this explicitly. Mind you, they didn't say, OK, let's stop. Let's pick two other topics and do something else. It was purely through the really in-depth analysis of what the behavior was that they were actually doing was they were rotating through these subjects. And by and large, um, about 70 or 80% of the time, they're talking about these two subjects at the same time. Now let's look at the grad students over here. Um, long period of one subject, super long period of one subject, super long period of one subject. So essentially, the behavior of the grad students was actually very different. They tended to fix on one subject and spin their wheels on that subject. They didn't make a whole lot of progress. If when you actually analyze, you know, did they make progress over that? They didn't make a lot of progress. So what seems to be happening as part of design is these professionals have these little short cycles where they rotate through and push a piece of design and go somewhere else and push it, and then go somewhere else and push it. And they need to be able to do that because all these things relate to each other, right? They're, they're focusing on different parts and pushing those forward. So now, of course, then the question becomes, so, well, why don't the grad students do that? Aren't we teaching them this? Um, but then what is the nature of these subjects? Are these subjects concerns? Are these subjects the actual modules? What are the relationships amongst them? I think there's a lot of open questions of how this eventually gets resolved about what it is that you're talking about. What are these concepts, and how do they map onto the eventual implementation that's there? Do they one-to-one -one map onto things that show up in their architecture diagrams? And the answer is no, they actually didn't. So there's a certain kind of modularity that is very implicit in this design work um, that I wonder if we can make that much more explicit. Um, so to which degree do they represent modular concerns? Can tools leverage this kind of pairwise rotation? Should my design tool on the whiteboard every five minutes go, Bzzz, your time is up, pick two new su subjects and progress? Um, it'd be highly disruptive, but it would 
On the other hand, you know, be perhaps useful because now you're being forced to change your perspective and think about the design project in a different way. Um, could we maybe ask the designers to identify these subjects? I think it would be very hard for them to do um, because you're just so in the flow of actually working, it's all internalized. Um, do any other such imperceptive patterns exist? If we start looking at this, are there other kinds of patterns that emerge with respect to design and modularity that we don't know about? Um, and then, of course, the expert versus novice question. So how come these designers of Adobe did things very differently? Is that just from experience, from you know, having worked together, having not worked together? What is it that's caused them to adopt this kind of work, and uniformly so across the three professional teams versus the novices? So what, what changes from being a grad student to being you know, the architect of, of Illustrator? Um, unless you think that the architect, by the way, of Illustrator is always architecting, um, one of the major gripes when we talked to him was he did a ton of code reviews. Okay, so this, this is also with respect to the, the speaker this morning. You know, the architects are, at Adobe are very much nose to the grind in, in the midst of their code development because they did remote code development. The code changes came in and they wanted to preserve the architectural style and the patterns that were in the code. So they did actual code reviews and sent things back. This was not their favorite thing to do and you could ask are there ways for them to express what they want. Um, and that's one of the other vignettes that's there. But there clearly is sort of this notion of expert versus novice and what's going on there. And then the last one um, is distributed development. So this is less at the whiteboard, less at designing, uh, much more connected to Jim Herbslip's talk um, a couple days ago. So this is a picture of a development project. It's distributed. You can see the teams there and how many people are in each team. So 11 over here, 8 over there, 1 over there. And these represent work items that get passed from one team to another. So one team says, you need to do this piece of work. And then the other team says, you need to do this piece of work. Um, and then there's a little bit of color coding. Um, red means the creator of the work team to the owner. Green means owner to resolver. That means it actually was resolved. Blue means a reassignment, and, and et cetera. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. But what you can see is that from fall 2006, from the, from the fourth quarter of 2000, 2006 to the first quarter of 2007, this happened. Okay. The teams did not actually increase all that much in size. They might have been more productive, but you can certainly see that there's a lot more blue that starts to happening, so a lot more reassignment. Um, one quarter later, the picture looked like this, um, where also yellow got introduced, where a lot of items were created that were subsequently resolved. So they were directly assigned, and they tended to be resolved already. So what you can see is that in this distributed world, things get intertwined. The efforts of the different teams get intertwined much more than you would hope. Um, and now I'm going to juxtapose that with a couple of videos that Nick says. Next one. This one. This one. Okay. So the video you're going to watch um, is a video of the open source development of Scarab, which is a, an open source um, project. And what you're seeing is a, each of these piles represents an actual developer and their contribution to the code. So the larger the pile is, the more that person is actually developing. Um, the color coding represents the kind of things they're developing. Um, what are they developing? C code, Java code, header files, um, GIF images, and et cetera. And as more people start joining the project, you see that more piles start appearing. So this is the typical open source development. You see more people starting to participate. Um, and as, and I'll, I'll show this one more time. Um, as the pile comes to the front, that means a recent change. As the pile moves to the back, it means a change that is very old. Um, and so this developer over here is pretty dormant, though he actually started the project. So he, he contributed a little bit. Um, and then this developer here, who you see all the time, actually went completely gung-ho and adopted the project, and he was the one who started building this. And so you can see that some people contribute, and then they, they slowly go to the back. Um, which means they contributed a little bit, and then later on contributed a little bit, and some people are much more active. So now let's go <coughs> to the second video. So this is the same project, um, just a little while later. So I, I think it's about a year later. Um, you can see the date over there, and you see that there's lots of people who have contributed now. Clearly, there's a core group of developers that we know, and there's an incidental little project that gets done. But there's not a whole lot of active development, actually, at this moment in time. Um, and so you see the project is growing. And again, a couple of more people join. And what I'm going to do in the next video is I'm going to switch the view. So now you're not going to see developers. Now each of those piles actually represents an artifact. So if an artifact gets moved, it, it jumps to the forefront. And so what you're going to see now. Here. 
So clearly you notice there's a lot more artifacts. Um, and you also see that the effect of the changes is actually quite large. So there's a lot of artifacts. And this is one of my favorite ones. You might wonder why did all these artifacts get changed at the same time? Somebody actually generated um, some code, right? They had a file, generated a bunch of code, and checked that in. So from, from the repository, we can see that that had actually quite a broad effect. And here they did it again. Um, and so you can see that um, there's quite a bit of development, but actually what you are not seeing in this particular case is long tails of code that's actually pretty dormant. That code is not changing very much. Um, so, and now what I'm going to do in the last video, and this, is, this connects back to that worldview view, is I'm going to show you the piles of artifacts when two or more people are working on them at the same time. Okay? And there's a very fascinating pattern that emerges. So notice that there's a bunch of them. And here's actually one where three people worked at it at the same time. And there's a bunch of stuff that happens. And now what you're going to see is you're going to see that window get narrower. And all of a sudden, there's not a whole lot of parallel work happening. And then you're going to see the window get wider. Um, and then you're going to see that, hey, more, more parallel work's happening, and people changing the same file, right? And changing the same file tends to not be good because you get a merge conflict and all these other kinds of things. Um, and so the effect that you're seeing is it widens and it narrows, and it widens and it narrows, and it widens and it narrows. Um, and what the widening corresponds to is the upcoming release. The closer the upcoming release date, the more parallel work tends to happen. Now, there's a nice study by, um, was it uh, Dwayne Perry and others, um, and there's other studies like it that say the more parallel work happens, the more bugs get incident in your system. Um, so what this shows is that the closer you get to the deadline, combined with the other finding over there, there's more parallel work and probably more bugs incident in your system. Um, and the other thing that it shows is that, of course, we haven't really cleanly modularized, perhaps. Right? There apparently is a need to be touching the same stuff as part of the changes. So what's going on here, and why, why, is, that, why is that the case? Um, so now let's go back to the presentation. So if you take these two together, um, then the work of Herb's Lab and the work of others starts questioning this role of the API. Right? And one of the things that, that's being found is that the API is very effective in separating work, but also tends to me mean isolation of work. So the work that this person does and the work that this person does, they don't talk to each other a whole lot, whereas often they actually should be talking to each other because they're going over this relationship, they're going over this bridge. Um, and so the question is, could we encourage them to remodularize, for instance, to reduce the problems that are here? Or should we designing, be designing the modularization much less so for you know, the individual components and how they connect to each other, but much more from the perspective of coordination. I think that's the same question that Jim Herbslip is asking is, you know, should we be developing so our development processes are smooth as opposed to so the code looks nice there? Um, and I think there's a real question in there um, and as to whether, you know, tools could help us better on the modularization side from the code or whether they could help us more on the coordination side. Um, and that balance, I think, only when you bring the two together is going to be, become much clearer. So if I take all these lessons that, that I talked about, um, the vignettes really represent merely a slice of the broad range of activities, notations, and everything else that designers use, right? especially in the broad range of design that I look at. There are some general observations. Modularization itself is typically not the main goal that these designers have. Right? They're working to build a new feature. They're working to design an architecture. They're working to um, address a problem that a customer has. So, Actually, getting to something that's neatly modularized is not something that's at the forefront of the discussions very often. Uh, usually, it gets talked about much more sort of towards the late end of the discussion. Are we doing this right? Are we having the right architecture? Um, you can question whether it's the right approach, but it's just a phenomenon that we observe. Um, there's a big interplay between problem understanding and solution building. Okay? Th this is a crucial piece from taking this design perspective. As you're designing your solution, you will you know, almost always need to know more about the problem that you're solving. You'll have to go back to your client. You have to go back to somebody to ask what's going on. And the same as your programming, you might have to go back to the architect. Why did you do it this way? Is there something else? And this can lead to a lot of redesign. Um, immediate versus emerging modularizations. We saw these modularizations that slowly but surely evolved and sometimes are completely reappropriated. Are there languages in which we might say, you know, we're pretty sure about this one, but not so sure about this modularization, right? Well, we said earlier this morning, holding off the decisions that we can make until later, maybe actually we don't need to hold off because in my view, they're actually quite important decisions that need to be made, but maybe we can say, we're not quite sure about this one or, or we're 90% sure about this decision and we can work with something that has that, that in, insecurity with it. 
Um, there's the tension of expressiveness versus usability. Right? The whiteboard is so appealing to the designer because they can draw anything they want. Um, it's not necessarily very expressive on the other hand, and that's where you want the more strong design tools. Um, can, we, can we bridge the two? Um, tools are important. I'm a tool builder as part of my research, and so I always will say that tools are important, but I think they really can overcome a lot of the issues that are there. And design is social. It's, it's a person-to-person -person interaction. That's where design happens, and I think we need to look more at that social interaction and what happens. There's a caveat here, which is the quality of the designs. Right? We didn't check necessarily whether these were the best designs that are emerged. We assumed that these were high-end designers, and they would know what they were doing. Um, now, it might be that the grad students, in their inadvertent way, might have designed better quality designs than the professionals. From what we can, can judge by eyeballing, not necessarily so. But on the other hand, you know, this is something that eventually somebody will have to study. So the road forward to me, with respect to modularity and design, um, really is one of additional studies. And I hate to say that, but we really have never looked very closely at how people actually design software. You know, what are the kinds of decisions that they make? How do they work? Um, how do they work through this design problem? And can we better support them in that process? Um, this question is interesting. Are we bringing designers to tools, i.e., we build a tool and say, designer, use it? Or should we bring tools to designers and look at what designers do and bring tools that help them in what they're doing? Um, I think that's a very different kind of approach. Um, what is the purpose, right? Again, questioning what the purpose of modularization is. We, we have a set, but is that the only set? And is there a broader set? Um, and I think classroom, um, and I'll, I'll talk, to, talk about that in, in a minute. Um, so here, what time do we have, Harold? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, that's perfect. That works. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is run Calico, um, which is a software design tool for the electronic whiteboard that we've designed at UCI. We've been working on this for about four years. Um, and you should envision designers standing at whiteboards like this. So they're interactive whiteboards. You can draw on them. They can also draw on the tablets. Um, and then I can sh show you what, what actually happens. So, maybe it's not working, Nick. No, because it, uh, I can't see the uh, menu at the bar. Hold on. Just restart. It. Just can't. Try that. It should be able to. No, the menu doesn't show up. Dead. Yeah, it's dead. So, I'll show you the machine now? No, no, no. You should just restart it. Okay. Where do you restart it? Uh, just launch it differently. Okay. From the, yeah. Let's see, let's see if we can restart. So part, part of what we're doing here is actually we're talking to a server that's in Irvine um, as opposed to a server that's local. Um, so we're just hoping that the network works here. Shouldn't. He says it's going to take a couple minutes to load. Hopefully not. This is unfortunately an artifact of switching machines. So. Is it? I don't want Google. Yeah, no, not going to work. It's OK. Um, what, what we'll do is we'll skip it. Oh, now we're launching Outlook. This is even better. Um, I want to go back to Windows 95. I know how to use that. Um, so <laughs> anyways, so the, but what, what you would have been able to see is this evolution of people sketching on the board, um, highlighting pieces of that board, and those becoming active objects that I now can manipulate and draw, and all at the, f at, at the tip of the pen. So where what you get is you get this, this notion of what they do on the whiteboard, but now augmented in the way that you can actually interact with it and design with it um, and refine. So we can actually take that list. We could put the boxes around it. We can then make that a real list, mark off what has been changed, and et cetera. And these boxes that we have, they actually refine into user interface elements, into UML elements. And they support this fluid notion of starting with very vague ideas, going into something that is much more concrete. Um, and then the last bit that I have, and here you can see a little bit of it, the last bit is that I actually also think a big rep, um, responsibility lies in the classroom on this. Okay? So when we teach design in the, in, the, in the software engineering course, the typical thing that I see is, you know, you've developed requirements. Go make a design. I'll tell you what UML look like. Now go home. Come back two weeks from now. Hand in your design, and we'll grade it. Um, and that tends to be the typical way in which we do it. And what we're missing is all that rich stuff happening in between 
where the actual design gets decided upon and where the conversations happens. And that's where I think an instructor can be very, very effective. So what we're doing in my classroom now is, you can see the little Play-Doh here, is we start actually with design exercises that are not software. So I give them boxes of Play-Doh and sticks and pen and paper and I say, could you design um, an award for a software engineering conference and you have 10 minutes? And they all go, we can do that, but in 10 minutes, everybody's got an award. And they all look like something, they mean something, they have a design, they might have drawn it, they might have prototyped it with a little Play-Doh, they might have used the sticks, they might have done interesting things. Then I say, now let's design the ideal chair for in the classroom. They have a lot to say about this. Um, I give them 20 minutes, <laughs> and they come up with all sorts of interesting things, and especially what they start doing is they start frumpling a piece of paper and throw it away. They start actually drawing the chair from multiple perspectives. They start specifying dimensions of the chair. They start specifying the features that they want to have. They start specifying the trade-offs that they want to have, all in 20 minutes, right? And then I go to software and I say, now could you design a piece of software? And all that creativity comes to this grinding halt because now when there's a box that gets drawn, that box has a very important status because I thought long and hard about it. So all that natural creative stuff that they do in the classroom when they design other things I want them to bring that to software because when I ask them, could you design three versions of this system, they all grumble. The first one they spend a lot of time on. The second one they say, oh, Andre wants a second one. Maybe I can think about it. By the third one they go, it's 2 a.m. I got to make something. Let me make something. And then when invariably they come and they say, yeah, I finished three, I say, now go, go combine the three. That's the next assignment. And invariably out of that third one, they can actually apply concepts that make the first one better. So what you want to do is you want to get that creative notion, that broad exploration, that, that natural engagement with design into the classroom so that we start considering software in more depth. Because there's sort of this, this notion that software is so special, but it, it really isn't. It's just something that you got to design. It's something that you got to work through. Um, so with that, um, for me, the motto of the talk is treat software engineering as a design discipline from beginning to end. That has a lot of implications. I've just shown you some minor slivers of that. It's not something I can do by myself. I think this, this requires a broad look. Um, study it as such, provide the tool support as such, and teach it as such. I think those are three critical elements there. Um, and modularity, I think that that's the other big lesson here, is in the eye of the beholder, right? Who's using the system for what purpose, and what do the parts and relationships actually need to give them to make that happen? And so it's not a single absolute property of the code, but it's something that, that's, that's in the judgment. And then finally, may my flight back actually make it on time. So <laughs> thank you very much, and I'll, I'll take questions. Hi, thanks for the great talk. And, uh, one thing that you said is that uh, people only think about modularity in these experiments at the end or kind of late. So I was wondering if uh, those experiments were carried on by a group of people to, that are working together and that all of them make all design decisions in the same place. So the experiment was, naturally, it was a small experiment. It was a two-hour window. Right? So one of the things that I want to do next is actually get prolonged sets of designs and see what happens when we, when we give them more time. Um, yeah. Though what was interesting is for a number of the architects, there was actually one session that's, that only took one hour. And they said, you know, we're finished designing. We're going to hand this off to an implementation team. So in their mind, they had done what needed to be done. Um, and it certainly didn't look like a full UML diagram yet. Yeah. Um, so it, I think there's interesting questions to when that comes into play and, and, and when they hand that off. And now, you know, in the tool that we have, the Calico tool, one of the things we actually want to do um, is support that refinement so the handoff happens properly. Yeah, because what I would uh, expect is if you have a long list of design decisions to make, uh -huh. then modularity would, would appear very early in the process because you would have to share, like split those design, those, this, those, uh, design parameters as Baldwin and Clark call them, and then would have to you know, define interfaces and so on. Yes. Yeah, and, and that happens implicitly, right? The, the list that they make and the boxes that they put around and the interactions that they start drawing are about modularity, but not sort of in the traditional sense that we, that we think of, okay, what are the interfaces, what are the boxes? They're, they're still doing this at a very general level. Um, but yeah, no, certainly they do some of that. Is it my turn? Yeah. Okay, first, thank you very much for a very, very, very interesting talk. Um, 
I liked a lot this framework that you gave us at the beginning. Okay. Um, great, I can take it and use it, I hope. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> For putting my work in, in kind of in context. Now, thinking back, I mean, um, you are saying, and I agree, software engineering as a design discipline and give the designers the right tools. Uh, now let's think about tools in terms of programming languages, uh, development environments, because that's where I come from. Yep. Um, what are the lessons that we can learn also in terms of the, this framework that you showed us, the four? Uh, um, yeah. Where can we, as language designers or um, IDE designers, help um, designers what in their work from, <laughs> from what you have seen in your experiments? Yeah. Um, I, I think in some sense the second half of the talk starts going into that direction, but I think the distance of what I've seen people do versus what, what sort of support we provide is still pretty large. Um, on the other hand, um, there's some projects nowadays that are trying to reinvent the, the, the IDE itself. Um, so there's Code Canvas at Microsoft, and there's Bubbles coming out of uh, Rice Group. Um, there's Lighthouse that we're doing. And, and what they're trying to do is more closely match, sort of, and Mylan is, is one of them, is more closely match what we're given to work with as opposed to it being the entire system in a flat file. Um, you know, Code Canvas shows it in, in context. The Bubbles project just shows what, what was involved in the particular problem. In Lighthouse, when you're coding, we give you the, the design right away. We just for everybody, so you immediately see design conflicts and et cetera. So I think there's, there's beginning steps moving in that direction, but I think there's a big space in the middle um, where I suspect you're about as curious as I am how to fill that, and I, I don't have any necessarily good answers there yet. To make the question a little bit more concrete, I mean, I could see the, the this in, the, in your circle. Uh -huh. the, the four the quadrants? Yeah. yeah, four quadrants, the, the top right one is where things are starting to move. Yes. Uh, any hope we can do anything in the... Yeah, I hope so too, because I think that, that to me is the most interesting thing, is you have a million lines of code and you say, I need to worry about performance, and you get sort of a mini working version of that code, and it's 100,000 lines of code or 50,000 lines of code. I'm really curious whether such a mapping could actually be created so that I can work with something that's a lot simpler that still has effects on what's, what's below there. And, and I think that, that, that's an interesting question, whether we can achieve that. But that's... Not, that's on still the not right. on the bottom. That's on the bottom right. For me. Right, left. Because you, right. you get you bottom get a right. mini system. Yeah. Bottom right. Bottom yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Any other questions? I have one. Uh oh. So, so as you pointed out, modern can be a separation of work, so that people can think about their area and not have to worry too much about all the other areas. And yet at the same time, some of those interaction diagrams you were showing suggest that designers jump back and forth an awful lot yeah. between these different areas, and they really need to do that in order to understand relationships and all. Yep. So it's be, it suggests that at the design level at least, maybe, maybe there's hope at the implementation level, but at the design level at least, one can't modularize too much, at mm -hmm. least from the point of view of what people think about. Any, right. any comments and, on that? Well, I, 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 and I think if, if you carry that through, that might show you the difficulty of programming, right? Is, is if, if things are so intertwined already when you're designing things and you need to understand one piece to work on the other piece, you know, what, what's, what's the good hope that we can actually separate them all together and say, you just do this piece without knowing anything about the other one? Um, I, I think that hope is actually somewhat futile, and I think part of, part of what I see these environments do now is sort of give you reason and context why these things are related um, and give you sort of the, the meta view of, you know, this, this is coming from somewhere and it is related and you need to keep that relationship in mind. Um, so, so I don't necessarily think you can really separate them, but maybe we can tell you why they're related in, in a much better way. So. See if I can figure out how to keep the microphone working. <clears throat> in the experiment you did, or um, <clears throat> the case study of the professional designers yeah. and the grad students, <clears throat> could you characterize those two groups with respect to the following question? Their degree of artistic accomplishment in other areas of their lives. I, I honestly don't know, because we didn't ask them about that. Um, we, you know, we didn't, so, so I, 
there is a certain fluidity in sketching and drawing and, and that kind of stuff that influences how well, how easy you can design and how ready you are to throw things away. Um, I, I didn't get a sense that some of them were esoteric artists or not. I, I don't, I, across the whole board, I think it's pretty even, even handed. Not esoteric, but accomplishment because yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That I saw what the professional designers were doing, if you, if you film some, a painter painting, mm -hmm. That's what it would look like they were doing. They do a yes. little here, a yeah. little there, a little there. Yeah. Whereas someone who's an analytic thinker would to create yeah. and then grind down yeah. somewhere else. Yep. So and and I think part of part of the question underneath this is, you know, is is that an, an, a fundamental thing that designers do, like painters, and is that somehow acquired even as part of software design? Right? Do they acquire that ability to, to move back and forth and still keep the whole piece in mind? And I, I think the answer is yes. So. Yeah, kind of related on that is because is I was thinking the group of professionals, had they worked together for a long time as well? No, not necessarily. No. no. There, okay. there were people at the same organization. Some teams had worked together. Some teams had, you know, they knew okay. each other, but they hadn't necessarily worked together. So, okay. So it's not, okay. Because sometimes I think that can have an effect as well, yes. too, yeah, when no, I was certainly, looking certainly. at all the different parallel yeah. things. Yeah. If we communicate together a lot, we may be used to being able to yeah. switch context is very quickly. No, that was, okay. that was by design that we had some of those teams and some not. And, so. and also, too, even though you talked usually design is a social thing, and I would say in general that's the case, sometimes you have single designers. Yes. And they're introverts or whatever. Have you looked or thought much about that from that perspective? It's hard to get in their heads. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I could put a videotape on them working by themselves, but when you have the two designers talking, you actually get more of a sense of what's going on. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, there, there's a wide range, right? Three designers, people in, in different settings. There's a lot to be looked at, certainly. Certainly. So. Thank you. Thank you. Between me and ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> don't stand between people and their ice cream. Thank, right. thank, right. thank you very much for a, for a most thought provoking talk and for getting here thank under you. very adverse circumstances. Thank you. Before I give up the mic, I just want to add my own thanks.